Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. So we are in a new sermon series that we started last week called Resurrection. Um, it's a six-week deep dive, I'm calling it a deep dive, into 1 Corinthians 15 that we've broken up into six Sundays, which we look forward to culminating this great chapter on resurrection with the celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday. So that's the idea behind this. Now, for us who have been following Jesus for, t- for some time, like belief in the resurrection is kind of a given, isn't it? Like that's pretty staple belief. But as I mentioned last week when we kicked off this series, for some of the Corinthian believers there in Corinth that Paul is writing to, they actually were denying belief in the resurrection. They were denying the resurrection, not necessarily the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but the future bodily resurrection of believers from the dead, which is kind of problematic. Like that's a big, significant part of Christian belief, teaching, and theology. And so Paul is working to establish the historical reliability of Jesus' resurrection from the dead as, and as a way of laying the foundation for the case that he's going to make that that's the basis for the believer's future resurrection from the dead. And I mentioned some of this last week. I couldn't keep myself from going here where we're going today that I worked in, in college ministry on a secular campus for uh, eight years and often I would attend as I was able these lectures that the religious studies department would bring in guest speakers, guest lecturers to, to lecture. I was interested in what was being taught kind of in the classrooms and it seemed to me that almost every lecture, guest lecture that came from the, at the invitation of the religious studies department, there, it was like they were bent on undermining historic Christianity. Like undermining historic Christian doctrine, the deity of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead, all of those things, which honestly is just kind of par for the course. I don't know why that is par for the course uh, uh, for secular academia. It's kind of like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, like where are the debaters of the age, the philosophers of this age? Like God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. Like, like we are too wise for our own good. And so these lectures were basically um, an attempt to undermine, and the one that I'm referring to, that I'm thinking I have in my mind, was undermining confidence in the biblical story of the actual physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. I remember this one lecture came in, and ironically, he presented as historical fact his theory that the earliest disciples of Jesus didn't believe in Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. He argued that after Jesus died, they felt so strongly that the spiritual presence of Jesus was with them still because he had been so meaningful to them that they actually began to speak of him actually really being alive and over time they eventually began to speak of him as being physically present with them. So this is kind of this legend that sort of develops. And so ultimately the heart of the argument there was that this belief in the resurrection of Jesus was metaphorical, not historical. The reason I say it was ironic that that was his view was because he was positing as historical fact the view that it wasn't about history but it was about metaphor. So what we're going to see today from this scripture is that Christian belief in the resurrection of Christ is reliably rooted in history. Now, that's kind of my big idea. As I was talking with McGregor, I was like, where were you earlier when I needed you? Uh, He he basically said, so yeah, so the way that I'd say it is that um, it's a historical fact you can build your life on. Like, I like that. So you can say this way, it's reliably rooted in history. It's a historical fact that you can build your life on. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, as I think about the nature of sermons, sometimes they vary depending on the text because we're committed to expositional preaching and teaching right through the scripture. So um, this, to me, feels a little bit more like an equipping kind of teaching for believers on the historical reliability of the resurrection. And and that way, it might feel more like a a lecture geared toward the mind than toward kind of the exhortation toward the heart, which is my bent. is is really toward, I guess I have a, I I feel like I have a gift toward exhortation. Like, I never want to just, like, say facts and just go, there it is. Like, I always want to say, then what? But this one is a little bit more, we're supposed to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I appreciate and value the life of the mind. And so in that way, it might be more like a lecture, hopefully confirming for you, if you're a believer in Jesus, that your faith is well-founded. And if you are a skeptic or you've been on the fence about Jesus, maybe you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, maybe this is going to be helpful for you if you have intellectual doubts that will help make a cumulative case for the resurrection. Now, I say cumulative because I don't think that any argument is airtight. I mean, anything that I say or anyone says in in, in favor of establishing the historical reliability of the Bible is not going to have an airtight case. You could always say, well, what about this or what about that? But I think that overall, 
if you engage on these things, that there is a cumulative case, that it has a force behind it, that we who follow Jesus can base our faith and our lives on the fact that he historically, in time and in space, in history, rose bodily from the dead. Now, I'm saying bodily. Sometimes I'll say bodily resurrection, and sometimes I'll just say resurrection. When I say bodily, it's because I'm, I'm countering that idea that it was just a spiritual kind of thing, that it was just kind of the presence of Jesus was with us. Like he actually rose physically bodily from the dead. And we're picking up today, right where we left off. I was emailing with Veronica, who just read the scripture from us, and she asked me where we started. I said, I know we're starting kind of in the middle of Paul's thought, but that's how we do. We left off in verse 5 last week. Pick up right in verse 6. I know it's kind of awkward, so I'll give us the context. Like Paul's been saying, here's the core essential elements, the four core pieces of the gospel that we have preached. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Christ was buried. Christ was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and Christ appeared to the apostles. So those are the four core components. And he now is continuing, as we go from verse 6 to down to 11, he's continuing by arguing for the historical and physical reality of Christ's resurrection from the dead. So what I want to do I got a lot of words. I, surprisingly miraculous, I finished early, like 10 minutes early last gathering. And I was like, oh man, should I talk longer? Because the worship team's not here yet. And I'll just be like, amen. <laughs> talk slower. I have a hard time talking slower, especially when I'm excited. I'm always excited about, about this stuff. Thank you. I'll try. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I won't. But I have a couple of key, like two kind of high level observations from the text. And I want to draw out a bunch of different kind of like implications of that and, and, and responses as we think through that. And here's the first kind of obser- main observation from the text, which is right there on the surface. The risen Jesus appeared to many people. The risen Jesus appeared to many people. Look at what Paul says in verse 6. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. He's talking about the risen Jesus, the bodily risen Jesus. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers. Now, brothers is a way of saying brothers and sisters, believers, disciples at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism, a New Testament euphemism for they've died. Most are still alive, but some have died. Now we should ask the question, why would Paul throw in that little phrase? Like, why couldn't he just say he appeared to more than 500 at the same time and leave it at that? Why do you think he adds most of whom are still alive? Any ideas? They're eyewitnesses. You can go ask them if you want to. They're still alive. So if there are any among you, Corinthians, and I know there are among you, There are some among you, Corinthians, who are doubting the reality of the resurrection. I invite you, and anyone who has doubts about it, to ask literally any of the hundreds of living witnesses right now. Like, you can write letters. Things can be discovered. Yeah, they're far away, geographically speaking, but the letter's still getting to them. They can do the investigation and see for themselves if they have any doubts about that. I don't think Paul would have issued that challenge if he wasn't convinced that there were people alive who actually saw Jesus. Like, unless he's bluffing. Again, nothing's airtight. You can come out, oh, he's just bluffing. No one's going to do that. That's hundreds of miles away. I think he's convinced, not only that he saw him, but that hundreds saw him, and they're still alive. You can go ask them. So now let's take some time to think through, and I'm just, in my mind, I've sort of compiled over the years of ministry, both on a secular college campus and just reading and, and, and culture, like some of the common objections to this idea of belief in a bodily resurrection of Jesus. I already touched on the first one a bit, but I want to flesh it out a little bit more. So here's num- number one. Eastern people weren't interested in historical facts. That's kind of the idea. Some critics of Christianity say that Easterners weren't interested in historical facts. Really, mo- what they were more interested and concerned about was expressing meaning through metaphor. Now, we don't have any problem with that as, as, as believers in the Bible because so much of the Bible is poetry. So much meaning and truth is conveyed through metaphor. God is a poet himself through the, pro- the prophetic writings, through the Psalms. So we're not against this idea that meaning and truth can be conveyed through metaphor, but as it relates to the conversation about Jesus and his resurrection from the dead, we are saying, no, this is not about metaphor, because they're saying that the resurrection is a metaphor for Jesus' spiritual presence with his early disciples. Was Paul an Easterner or a Westerner? Paul was an Eastern man. So let's let the Eastern people speak on their own terms as to whether or not they care about historical facts. When he says the risen Jesus appeared to over 500 believers at the same time, he's talking about historical event. He's not talking about a metaphor or a mass hallucination. I mean, there's some people that literally have said that the people, they so strongly believed in the presence of Jesus that they all saw him. 500 of them at the same time, were they all on mushrooms? I mean, the light, like that's not even a legitimate thing. Like, it's not a metaphor. It's not a mass hallucination. Here's another Eastern writer. They're all Eastern writers, by the way. Luke, 
is an Eastern man. He, was, he wrote the, the Gospel of Luke, the, this long book about the life and the ministry of Jesus. Listen to how he describes the nature of his writing at the, at the outset of his gospel. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word uh, have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. You get a, a sense of the flavor of what he's after? It's not a fairy tale. It's not fairy tale, right? There were no fairy, there was, there was myths, but they weren't like detail oriented. Like there is no literature in ancient history that, that has the flavor of realistic fiction where there's all kinds of like details and things like that. Like Jesus' head is, is asleep on a pillow in the stern of the boat. Like that sounds like, it could sound like fiction today when authors are writing fiction, but they're putting in details to make it sound realistic, like realistic fiction. That was, C.S. Lewis argues, he's read all ancient literature. He's like, there is no genre of realistic fiction. So later on at the end of the Gospel of John, when it says they, they pulled up 153 fish, that's an incidental detail. That is not, in, that is not a, a genre of literature at the time, which is to say, this is not legendary stuff that happens. These are detail-oriented eyewitness accounts of these things. Notice Luke doesn't begin like once upon a time in a land far, far away called Palestine. That's not how he begins. He was very concerned with accurately recording and reporting what Jesus actually said and did so that his readers would have confidence, confidence in what they'd been taught. See, yes, because the letters and the gospel, the gospels were written some years after the time of Jesus. So before these things were written down, it was oral tradition. It was oral teaching, passing things down. Like, I can't remember what's on the grocery list. That's why I FaceTime my wife. She's on speed dial. What do I need? Because I can't remember stuff that she tells me. And if you're laughing, neither can you. <laughs> I know this to be true. But in an oral culture, when they didn't have devices to plug things into, they didn't write stuff down. They had amazing memories. Like, some of these people could recite, some of these rabbis could recite the entire Old Testament. Like, the, the mind is amazing, and so these teachings were passed down, and so eventually they're like, okay, the years are getting on, and so we want to preserve this in writing, because writing was a thing. And so Luke is saying, I want this to be preserved. I want you to know that the things that you've been taught and that have been passed down, they're true. So you can have certainty. The things that I've written down are the things that you've been taught about Jesus. And what's fascinating, too, is when you look at some of the extra-biblical uh, literature, um, archaeologists and historians have corroborated that Luke was an amazing historian of the first rank. And they corroborate all the, the geographical and cultural details that are in his book, Luke and Acts. And so the question that we should ask is, if Luke gets it right on the incidental details, all the geography and all the cultural details, if those things line up and they check out, why should we assume that Luke gets it wrong in the bigger things, like on the resurrection? It might actually be that people come to the text with an anti-supernatural bias. So like the 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 theologically liberal group called the Jesus Seminar. I don't even know if it's still around. It was around back when I was doing college ministry. And they proposed that they are these, these New Testament scholars. And, and they come to the Gospels with this presupposition. Miracles don't happen. So therefore, when we study the, the Gospels and we encounter a miracle story, we know miracles don't happen, so they discount it. So it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an anti-supernatural bias. If you come to the text with an anti-supernatural worldview and conviction, of course you're going to come across a miracle story and say, that can't happen. But what if they can? What if they do? You've just written it off. So if Luke checks out on the small things, why assume that he gets it wrong on the big things? Okay, let's talk about a second common objection to belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The Gospels contain fabrications about Jesus, including the resurrection. They're fabrications or... or Maybe a more negative word, they're lies. Like, they're not true. They just, they just made things up because they have an agenda. That was the ridiculousness of the Da Vinci Code book. It's like there's all kinds of gospels out there. There's all kinds of writings out there. And so the church leaders, these were men in power who, who wanted a certain agenda to gain power, to gain following, to gain wealth. Because religion has been used in the history of the world and still is used to gain wealth and followers and influence, unfortunately. But then that gets thrown onto the early followers of Jesus and they just concocted a version, a divine version of Jesus, even though he was just a human rabbi and they selected and chose, the, they kept the books that they wanted that suited their agenda. So they fabricated these stories to produce a certain kind of Jesus. So let me give 
just a couple of responses to think about this idea of this objection that, that the, these are fabrications about, about Jesus and about the resurrection. First, the gospel writers recorded damaging, counterproductive information. Okay, what I mean by that is they include stuff that doesn't help their case. If you're trying to get a following, if you're trying to get people to think you're, you're, you're great and let's follow this Jesus guy who resurrected from the dead and you're trying to get this narrative out there to gain followers, and this is not true, but we're, we're going to write up, we're going to make up a story to be convincing. There's all kinds of stuff that they include that's counterproductive, counterproductive and damaging to their case. So, for example, on the night that Jesus was arrested, what did Peter do? He said, Lord, if I'll, I'll follow you. I'm never going to fall away. In the gospel, John said, I'm never going to fall away. I'm going to follow you even to the death. And what does Jesus say you're going to do, Peter? You're going to deny me. So he actually denies knowing Jesus. And after the crucifixion, where are the disciples? They're locked away in a room. John's gospel says they were in a room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. These are your fearless leaders. Like, why include that stuff if you're trying to present a strong case that you should give your life to, these, to the, what these guys are telling you? Like, there's not a great case to be made when you're like, okay, so for example, Peter is like the, the leader, the main leader of the early church. And s- supposedly, according to, to early Christian tradition history, uh, Peter was Mark was, a, was kind of like, and Peter were together, and Mark's gospel is more along the lines of, of Peter's actual account. If I'm overseeing the editing process, I'll be like, can you please leave that part out about me denying Jesus? It's like if a guy's running for the president of the United States and trying to gain confidence and gain votes, he should not um, tell a biographer about how he flunked out U.S. government and history in college. Like, not a good idea if you're trying to create a case. So that's just one thing, like... Why include, if these things are fabrications, why include all this counterproductive, damaging information? Here's another one. In that day in culture, women's testimony was considered inadmissible in court because culturally speaking at the time, women were not considered trustworthy, as trustworthy as men, and so they're, they're, they didn't admit their, their testimony in a court of law. Like we know that from, from the rabbinical writings, from the writings of that day. Let me ask you this. Who do the gospel writers say were the first witnesses to the resurrection? Women, Right? So we should ask the question, why then, if the gospel writers feel free to play fast and loose with the details and create a compelling scenario to get followers, why would you say that women were the first to see the resurrected Christ? Because women were the first to see the resurrected Christ, right? That's why. Again, if you're playing fast and loose, let's get that out of there. Let's, let's bring up some, like, some guy that's known in the community to be really well-respected, and let's name him as the first witness. Is not the women. Does it not say something about Jesus and, and about our Lord that, that he would choose women to be the first to receive the testimony? He obviously considered their testimony to be valid. He says, go and tell your brothers. And then they didn't believe him. So if you're playing fast and loose and you're just creating and cultivating a certain narrative and a story, leave that stuff out of there. Now, here's a second response to the idea that the resurrection was a fabricated story. And I think this is, is, is forceful and, and helpful. Is would the disciples willingly die for what they knew was a lie? Like, would you die? If somebody put, if somebody put a, a, a knife to your throat and said, we can't believe in such and such a thing that you had been spreading as a lie, would you maintain the lie and go ahead and get, your, get killed? Probably not. I don't think you would. Now, it is true that people in our world will die for something that is a lie because they think it's true. Like, I don't think suicide bombers, the suicide bombers will die for a lie. They think they're doing the right thing but they believe it's true. What I'm saying is if you know something is fake, if you've been spreading this story of a resurrected Jesus, he's alive, and yeah, we saw him, and you never did, and a, and a guy puts his, his blade to your throat and says, recant belief, you would recant. But the disciples were persecuted, and they were killed for preaching that Jesus had risen from the dead. Why not recant if you lied and are going to die? Here's a third objection. People in the pre-scientific world were gullible and predisposed to miracle stories. Like in the ancient world, before science and before we had empiricism and things like that, like people were just superstitious. Now, were they superstitious? Yes, there was a lot of superstition. But it's, I think it's chronological snobbery, as, as C.S. Lewis put it, to say that all people in the past, they were just gullible. Pre-scientific people were gullible and, 
At first, this might seem to carry some force, but when you pay close attention to the gospel accounts, the disciples in no way are depicted as being inclined to believe the story of Jesus rising from the dead. It's just the opposite. Now, I realize you might say, well, Tom, aren't you doing some circular logic here? Like, you're arguing for the reliability of the Bible from the Bible. Yes, there is a, some circularity to it, but hopefully I've shown you already some reasons to believe from within the, the Bible text itself and from what we know about culture in that time that there is a, a force of reliability behind this. And, and unless we're willing to just throw it out and say none of this is true, and let's not engage with any of this, then let's all just go home. But I think we should listen to what the Scriptures say about how the disciples responded to certain things. At the end of Luke's gospel, when Jesus first appears to his disciples, they didn't believe it was really him. They thought they were seeing a spirit. They thought they were seeing a ghost. So he shows up and they're like, what? It looks like Jesus, but they think they're seeing a spirit. Luke 24 says this, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Touch me and see. You see the physicality of this? And he says, For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, they're disbelieving. They're not being portrayed as like, faith. well, we're in. Like they're just springing at any opportunity to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. No, there's actually a skepticism in them. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it before them. Why is he doing that? He's like, I'm here. I'm actually here, and it was hard for them to accept that he was here. So this isn't a group of men predisposed to believe a miracle story. They're not just so hopeful and, and wishful in the thinking that Jesus, they think he's dead and gone. Like, they, it's over. This guy that we put our hopes on to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, he's dead. You remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus? When Jesus is there and kind of keeps him, his identity hidden from them, and they say, haven't you heard? Like, we had our hopes. So we thought Jesus was the one to, uh, that we would set our hopes on. That Israel, he was Israel's redeemer. They think it's over. But he eats a piece of fish in front of them to convince them. And that's what it takes to show them that he's there physically. And then John's gospel tells us that the, gospel, that, that the disciple Thomas, who gets this moniker of what, remember? Doubting Thomas, Right? Is he, is he a guy that's just jumping to believe? Well, the scriptures say that he wasn't there when Jesus showed up. And in John 20, John 20 25 says, so the other disciples told him, Thomas, because he wasn't there, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, awesome, I've been hoping for that. No. He said, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. This is not a guy, again, he's not a guy that's just jumping to blindly believe in, in, that Jesus is alive again, to believe a miracle story. And a week later, Jesus comes back and shows Thomas his hands in his side. What I love about this, about this story in particular with his disciples and Thomas, and about the, even the beginning of Luke's gospel, is that Jesus doesn't demand blind faith. Like, whenever... You read through the scripture, even when God speaks to his people in the Old Testament, he, he may tell them to do something or make a promise to them, and usually it's followed by a for or a because, and he grounds, his, he gives us reasons. He gives us reasons. So he's not asking us to blind faith to just believe in something that we have no evidence for. Like, we wouldn't have the Bible if God said just believe. We'd have like one word, Jesus did this, he died and rose again, believe in him if you want to have eternal life, end of story, see you later. But instead, we have this whole thing, and we have Luke saying, hey, I've written all these things down, which are eyewitness accounts, so that you may have certainty about the things which you have been taught. So Jesus is accommodating to our weaknesses of faith. I think that's encouraging if you have been a believer, or maybe you're not a believer, and you struggle to believe some things. We're like the father that Jesus heals his son, the man's son, who has a demon, and he says, everything's possible if you believe. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. So if you ever struggle with intellectual doubts, then understand that Jesus is accommodating. And he's given us his word. He's given us the testimony of eyewitnesses. He's given us a community to talk through these things. And he's patient with us. And he doesn't shame us for the doubts that we might have. Faith and reason get pictured in, in, in secular society as being completely at odds. Well, if you're a person of faith, like, well, you're a person of faith. I'm a person of reason. As if those two are against each other. That's how they get pitted against one another as opposites, but they're complementary. Reason informs and supports our faith. That our faith is a reasonable faith. Otherwise, why would we even talking about these things? Why would Jesus show up? Why would Paul say these things? Why would Paul issue an invitation to talk to living witnesses 
if, if we didn't care about reasons and evidence and things like that. So maybe you've struggled or are struggling to trust in the truthfulness of, Bible, of the Bible. Jesus invites any and all earnest seekers and skeptics to investigate for themselves and hopefully to find the confirmation that they need in order to believe. And I say earnest or sincere skeptics because I, I, I have enough history and time with people that, that I know there are some people that no matter what you say, they don't want to believe. Because coming to Christ is not just an intellectual thing. There is a surrender of our wills. And even as a Christian, sometimes I don't want to surrender my will. So sometimes when people are very hardened to the gospel, there's something deep that says, I, I don't want, I don't want to believe. And I, man, there's a, there's, a, there's a brother in our church who by God's grace about 10 years ago, um, I was in conversation with and he just seemed hungry. He was a, he was a real seeker and he's part of our, our church now. And like we had, I was leading a class and I was taking the class through some things and he just wanted to talk through. And it was like, he just, it was like he was so ready to just know, know Christ, to want to know God, that he just wanted to talk through some things. And I, I was preparing myself for every, all of the, the, the rebuttals and the rejoinders and stuff. And there were none. He was like, okay, that makes sense. And, and, and this one here, yeah, here, this. Okay, that makes sense. And, and like that was such a different experience from some people. I've spun my wheels talking for hours. And it's like everything I say, there's a, there's a pushback. And I think if, if we are just, like, if we want to know ultimate reality, we want to know what it, who is God, and if we are earnestly seeking, then Jesus invites us to say, Lord, would you show yourself? Not in defiant, prove yourself. I'm going to drop this pen. If it hits the ground, you're not real. People do stuff like that. It's like, really? God has to condescend? He's got an answer to you for that? But if you ask honestly, Lord, would you show yourself to me? God will show himself to you. And maybe today is the day where you're realizing God is showing himself as reliable, reasonable, and that his word is true. Now, here's the second major observation I want to make from the text. The resurrection turned critics into Christians. Maybe I should qualify and say the resurrection turned some critics into Christians. Verse 7 says this, Then he, that is Jesus, the risen Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Now, this James is the brother of Jesus. Half-brother, if you will, right? If you're going to get technical. Like, Jesus had biological siblings, but Joseph was not Jesus' biological father, right? but Mary was his mother, and, and Jesus had brothers and sisters in his nuclear family. And James, this is not the James of, uh, brother of John, one of the original 12 disciples. This is the James who became a leader of the New Testament church in Jerusalem and who wrote the book of James, which is a New Testament book. So what do you remember, if anything, about Jesus' brothers? Did they believe in him? They didn't believe in him. Can you blame them? You're like, I see what you look like in the morning when you wake up. You're the king of Israel, the promised Messiah. Like, I know you. Like, in John 7, 5, it says this about Jesus' brothers, which includes James, for not even his brothers believed in him. They challenged him, why don't you go up to show yourself? To, if you're really who you say you are, go up to the feast and show yourself to everyone and do your miracles, and then everyone will believe in you. That, and then John makes this little parenthetical note, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So James didn't believe in him. And then you get James, who you find in the book of Acts, is, the, is one of the leaders, key leaders of the New Testament church in Jerusalem, and then he's writing a New Testament letter. How does he go from unbelieving brother James to believing brother James, proclaiming his brother Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God? What can account for that change? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I would ask you this question. Isn't it possible that the fact that Jesus is said to have appeared to James, couldn't that change James' mind about his brother? Yeah, it could, right? Like, I didn't believe you. He'd be like, I mean, I'm so sorry. I had... I didn't know. And now you're standing in front of me. You're the resurrected Messiah. That could account for what changed James' mind about his brother Jesus, turned him from a critic to a Christian. Now, Paul was another critic turned Christian. Look at verses 8 and 9. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul was actually more than just a critic. He was a persecutor. So this persecutor of Christians becomes a proclaimer of Christ. And as a consequence, he also becomes a persecuted Christian. And what can account for such a radical transformation? This guy was breathing out threats and murder to the New Testament church. He hated Jesus. He hated Christians. He was a violent man. He, he, was, he would drag people from the synagogues and he would throw them into prison and he would give his stamp of approval when they were, ex when they were condemned to death. He supported their execution. 
So what accounts for this? Well, if you've been in the Bible, you're probably familiar with the story of Paul, formerly called Saul, on his way to the city of Damascus with letters from the chief priests giving him the authority to arrest the followers of the way, which is what the early disciples were called, the way. And he's going to Damascus, and he's got these letters, and he's going to drag them off. He's violent. He, he would beat Christians, and he would throw them in jail. He was enraged. And it says this in Acts 9, verses 3 to 6. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See the close connection Jesus has with his followers? He doesn't just say, why are you persecuting my followers? Why are you persecuting me? Jesus is so closely identified with us. He says, and who are you, Lord? That's not Lord like Lord Jesus. That's Lord like kind of master, like title of respect. Who are you, Lord? Because he doesn't know who it is. And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And he goes and he's blind for three days and he doesn't eat anything. He fasts for three days. It's not until a man named Ananias is told to go lay his hands on him that he might, and Ananias says, I'm not going to that. Ananias is like, I'm not going to that guy. Haven't you heard about him? And so it's funny, like, the Lord says to someone, go do this. And like, Lord, no way. I'm like, when Jesus is talking to you, you probably shouldn't say no. And he says, go. And he lays his hands on Brother Saul, receive your sight. And, and Saul believes in the Lord Jesus. He's forgiven his sins. He gets baptized. And he becomes this amazing missionary. He becomes this amazing missionary. And his whole life is transformed by meeting the risen Jesus. But years ago, I was having a conversation with, with a gal who was skeptical about these things. And she was like, well, couldn't all this stuff be made up? By Paul, like, couldn't I just write a bunch of letters and, and send them out and say this is what happened? Yeah, you could, possibly. But you have to ask some questions because there is a continuity, there is a consistency between the book of Acts and what it says about Paul being an anti-Christian persecutor and then the letters that he writes about his ministry. Now he becomes a persecuted one. And so what did Paul, we should ask the question, yeah, it's possible Paul just made stuff up. Maybe he was a lunatic. Maybe he was on something that day. Well, what did Paul gain by preaching the resurrection of Jesus if it didn't really happen? Money, power, influence, women? I mean, that's like crazy cult leader stuff, right? That's what cult leaders do. Say some stuff, maybe you don't even believe it, and get a following and get money and women and power and influence. What did Paul get as a result of preaching the resurrected Christ? Suffering and death is what he got. That's what he stood to gain. Oh, but there was so much more gain. Because he gained eternity. He gained the crown of life with Jesus. But this earthly stuff, he didn't get anything earthly. There is nothing motivating Paul on this planet, in this earthly life, to go preach the resurrected Jesus. You're going to preach the resurrected Jesus? He reads 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He gets beaten with rods. He gets whipped. He gets shipwrecked. He receives a stoning. I mean, he was brutalized. That's what he got. And he ends his life in prison in a dark, cold hole in the ground awaiting execution by the Roman emperor. That's what he gets. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, Paul would have never become a follower of Jesus and proclaimed these things. He would have never suffered and died as he did because it's not worth it. But he was convinced that he met the resurrected Jesus and this wasn't a hallucination. This wasn't a metaphor. This was an actuality because Jesus is alive and, and therefore he's, he's, because Jesus is alive and because he truly is offering new life, salvation, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, life eternal in God's kingdom under King Jesus, this is worth all the suffering. So I'm going to go preach. It's worth it. That's why he worked so hard. Look at verses 10 and 11. I worked harder than any of them, that is the other apostles, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. So, all of, the, all of us apostles, he says, we saw the risen Lord Jesus, and we all preached. They were all preaching Christ, and they were all suffering. So they were all convinced of the reality of the resurrected Christ. This is what took cowards and made them courageous. This is, what, this is why they go from hiding out in a room to fearlessly in the streets proclaiming Jesus is alive. And all these guys got persecuted and killed, maybe except for the, with the exception of the apostle John, who was who was cast out to the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. We don't know how he died, but the rest of church history tradition says that these guys all died. So they all believed firmly in, in the resurrected Jesus, physically, bodily. So therefore, they all preached Jesus resurrected. And therefore, they all suffered. And they all saw people come to faith in Christ. They all saw people get saved from sin and death through belief in this resurrected Jesus. So as we close, I would say, if you're not a Christian, and maybe you've been on the fence about Jesus. 
Maybe you've been indifferent to Jesus. It gives me some hope that you're not as indifferent maybe as as others are because you're here, so maybe there's something drawing you here. Um, I invite you and I encourage you to investigate him because this is too important. This is too important to consider Jesus as just some figure of history. Oh, yeah, he was a good rabbi or whatever. Like, he's more than a rabbi. He's more than just a historical figure. He is the crucified and risen Lord of all. And he's coming back again. And so the invitation stands to you, if you're indifferent or skeptical, is to press in, to ask questions. And there are brilliant people who have written books specifically designed to answer some of these questions and and doubts that we may have. And there are people here whom you may know who have been following Jesus, and I would encourage you to ask them why they believe in Jesus. Ask them about Jesus and how it's changed, and following Jesus has changed their life. Because the Lord is more than willing to let people ask questions. So long as we come in a spirit of humility and say, I'm not demanding you prove yourself to me, God, but I honestly want to know why I'm even alive. Why am I on this planet? You were created with a purpose. Most people out there, they don't know Jesus. They don't know why they're alive on this planet. This is why you're alive. And this is a historical fact, as McGregor said, that you can build your life, that you can build your life on. And if you are a follower of Jesus, then be encouraged today that your faith isn't anchored in air. It's anchored firmly in history and in truth and in historical reality. And you can build your life on it. It's reliably rooted in history. You know, many, have, many critics have, have predicted the death of Christianity. They just think, like, with science and technology, like religion and all spirituality is going, going away. Well, first of all, it's not because God has said eternity in the hearts of men. We are material and spiritual beings. And Christianity will never die. Why? Because Jesus is alive. And as long as he's alive, the Christian faith is never going to die because Jesus promised that he would build his church and that the gates of hell, or we could say the gates of death, would not prevail against his church. That he is alive and he's reigning and he's coming again. And in every generation, people are compelled by this true story, this true history of the life, the beautiful life, and the death, the crucifixion, and the amazing resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. People are always going to be believing in that because it's true and the Spirit of God is working and calling people to himself. Maybe that's you today. Maybe it's someone in your life that you need to share this truth with. And I do not think that we can argue people into the kingdom, but the Spirit of God can use these things as a stepping stone, as something that further opens the door to their hearts to believing in and receiving Christ as Savior and Lord. Let's pray. So God, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you that you would be gracious to us and and even, Lord, um, not demand a blind faith, but a reasonable faith is is what we're um, called to. And Lord, if you had just been concerned with us just believing without any good reasons to believe, why would we have a Bible? Why would we have this eyewitness testimony? You've given these things for us to, to, like Luke says, that we might have confidence, we might have certainty in the things which we've been taught. So thank you, Jesus, that you... uh, have accommodated to our weakness of faith and to our, to our doubts. And you meet us there, but you don't want to leave us there. So, Lord, help us to engage our life of the mind. And, and, and Lord, not let this be purely an academic exercise, but these are life-altering, life-changing, transforming truths. So we thank you for it and pray that if there's anyone here that, Lord, um, doesn't know you and maybe struggles with doubt, um, that maybe today, Lord, would be the day that they, that they make a commitment to to engage with you, if not follow you because they're not ready, then maybe today it's a day to engage uh, with you uh, by engaging these questions. So, Lord, we, we ask for your great continued grace to us. Give us strength to follow you. Uh, give us confidence in you and in your word and that you're with us. I pray these things in your name. Amen.